Um, so we spent this the last few days examining the legislation, making sure that it did exactly what the government said it was going to do, making sure there were no surprises, like the last time we were called to Parliament to pass emergency legislation. And we identified weaknesses within the bill that we wanted to see changed. We wanted to make sure that it was easier to access, that there were certainty on the front end, the way the government had originally structured it. Uh, employers would have to pay salaries first and hope that they qualified. This was identified as a, a hurdle that many businesses would not take advantage of the wage subsidy and therefore fewer jobs would be protected. So we spent the last few days proposing changes to this program. We now have a better bill. We have a better result for Canadians without delaying benefits by even an hour. The government itself indicated that it would be weeks before these benefits go out the door. We now, because of the work of the opposition, because of the work of the Conservative Party, we now have a better bill that will be easier for employers to access. Now, uh, in terms of next steps, there are still people who are falling through the cracks. There are still many small businesses who have received no income, uh, no revenue. Uh, there are no wages to subsidize. There's, uh, there are no shifts. Uh, we're talking about restaurants who have had their doors closed for almost a month now. Other types of businesses that uh, have been told not to order, uh, sorry, that have been told not to open their doors. Uh, there are no wages to subsidize at all. Uh, that's why we've called for measures like refunding the GST that those businesses have collected to allow them to pay their rent, to allow them to pay some of their bills so that they can stay afloat, reopen when this crisis is over, and more Canadians will have jobs to go back to. We've also called for the increase in the charitable giving tax credit. There are so many charities out there that uh, have seen a catastrophic drop in donations and uh, we believe this is a good incentive to get people to donate more so that those frontline charities who offer uh, so many good programs and services to Canadians will have the resources they need uh, to do the good work that they've done in the past. So we're going to continue to push the government to move in those areas and uh, to adopt other measures that we've been supporting. So first of all, just to be uh, completely clear, uh, we, we received the draft legislation and we immediately went to work to study it. We identified some weaknesses and we spent the last few days going back and forth with the government attempting to address the gaps in their own legislation. At the same time, conversations were happening about what future sittings of the House uh, might look like. Our support for, the, for the, the bill that we're going to be studying today in the House of Commons was never uh, dependent on those other conversations that were happening concurrently. Uh, we continue to push for in-person exchanges in the House of Commons where you get that dynamic back and forth while respecting public health directives. So as we've shown just a few weeks ago, and as we will show today, we can absolutely accommodate the directions from public health officials by having a reduced number of MPs from every party proportional to the normal uh, number of seats that they hold to provide Canadians with the transparency and oversight that this government needs, that every government needs all the time, especially in a crisis. So we're going to push for those. The, pres the Speaker of the House of Commons has, uh, has indicated that it would take weeks to have the capacity to have virtual sittings up and running. I don't believe we can wait. Uh, there's already lots of proof for why you need that accountability and why you need oversight during this crisis. The government has had to change its position several times in the past few weeks. Uh, so we believe that virtual sittings can augment in-person sittings and allow for more, a more broad participation from MPs from all around the country. Uh, but we, we, we very much believe that in-person accountability sessions in the House of Commons will lead to better results for Canadians. And uh, based off of what you're saying and the other opposition leaders, it sounds like today is a lot more uh, collegial than the last time we all met here. Um, does that mean today will the wage subsidy bill pass by the end of day today? Well, uh, I can't uh, speak for the other parties, but I can tell you that uh, I believe that there's consensus, uh, that, I, that, uh, that I, I'm, I'm told that the other parties have agreed uh, to, the, uh, to the motion that will be presented today. Conservatives certainly will. Uh, we, we have, remember, the reason why we're having this sitting today is because the government changed its original position. Uh, they introduced a wage subsidy at 10%. We indicated that that would not make the make a difference for the vast majority of businesses across the country. Most businesses have seen near catastrophic drops in revenue, and we believed a 10% subsidy would not protect jobs and not keep people working. So we called for an increase to that. 
the program was changed to 75%. So obviously we, we support those measures. And we are, uh, you know, we went back and forth for the past few days, trying to make improvements to the bill, making it more flexible, uh, giving employers certainty on the front end. We're pleased to see that the bill now will now uh, contain those measures. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we will be uh, facilitating uh, its passage today. And now we're talking a lot about um, giving money to people who are not working right now, but people who are working are still frontline workers and long-term care workers. And today we are hearing a number of stories of uh, people who are living in long-term care homes in very dire situations. Montreal Gazette published a story yesterday. We're also hearing of a long-term care home in Markham where staff have left. So what more should the opposition parties and the government be doing right now to uh, make sure that people's loved ones are being taken care of? Mm. Well, f uh, first and foremost, I just want to uh, extend my sympathies to anyone in a, in a long-term care home that is experiencing any, any type of... Uh, of a, of a drop in the quality of care that they may be receiving and to the loved ones of those individuals as well. Uh, as someone who had a parent uh, spend the last few years of her life in a, in a long-term care facility, I can only, I, I, I can absolutely understand where people uh, are, are coming from, the, the very real heartache that they're going through when they see their loved ones in uh, conditions that, uh, uh, that, 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 that the reports indicate. I believe this is precisely why we need to have these types of accountability sessions. There are, uh, there are important questions that need to be raised on many different aspects of this crisis. Obviously, the health side, ensuring that frontline workers have the protective equipment that they need, ensuring that standards are continued to be met across the country for the type, for the level of care that individuals receive. Um, so, you know, uh, I believe that there is always a role, both at the provincial level and the federal level, uh, to hold policymakers to account to hold governments to account and to propose ideas to how we can address these types of things when they happen. Ashley Burke, CBC News. Um, when it comes to Parliament sittings and your talks with the Liberal government, can you tell me if you've received any sort of commitment um, moving forward about what that's going to look like? We've had uh, what I would characterize as constructive conversations. Uh, there's no clear consensus uh, at this point on what that might look like. Obviously, this week the concentration was on today's sitting, uh, how that would proceed, and, and the bill that we'll be uh, debating later on today. Uh, I am hopeful that uh, the government will see the benefit to having that oversight and accountability. Uh, if we just take a few moments to, to look at decisions that were made from the beginning of this crisis that had to be reversed, originally the government was rejecting calls to impose travel restrictions. And, uh, and, and limit the number of people coming into Canada, from, especially from places that had seen a surge in the number of cases of COVID-19. They had to reverse themselves of that position. They originally brought in the wage legislation at 10% uh, because of uh, pressure from the opposition parties and because of voices in the small business uh, community. They've now increased that. So we've seen several times where parliamentary oversight and accountability gets better results for Canadians. So I'm hopeful that the government will uh, agree with that. We're going to be making the case over the next few days as to why this is so essential. Uh, I've had some, you know, I had a conversation with the Prime Minister the other day where I raised this issue and indicated that it was important for us, not as different political parties, but as representatives of Canadians, to make sure that we get the best possible decisions, the best possible programs during this crisis. Um, and during your talks as well, you mentioned you talked about the business, um, the eligibility, eligibility for businesses to apply for CERB. Were there any other demands you had that you didn't you didn't get um, didn't get during your talks? Well, as you know, we've been calling for some specific uh, for some other specific measures um, as it relates to the CERB. We're concerned that right now the the limit on the number of hours that people can work while receiving this benefit will actually have some adverse effects in some key areas. There are uh, businesses out there who do need workers. Uh, there are many grocery stores that have uh, extended hours now uh, that are looking for people to fill those, those jobs. And by limiting the number of hours that people can work while they're receiving the uh, CERB uh, may indeed lead to uh, gaps in, in, the, in the labor force. So we've called on the government to make that benefit more flexible. We're also continuing, even with the wage subsidy, we still believe that there needs to be improvements. Uh, there are many businesses that, uh, uh, that, that would like to be able to show their 30% drop in other metrics. So right now it's based on revenue. 
but we believe it should be more flexible to reflect drops in things like orders, uh, accounts receivables, uh, subscriptions, depending on the nature of the business itself. Uh, so we're going to continue to push for those types of changes as we go forward uh, as well. But uh, as I said today, we, we, are, we are satisfied uh, to allow uh, this bill to come to Parliament today, to be debated today, uh, based on the improvements that we were able to, to, to get uh, for the past week. You know, our, our team worked incredibly hard this week, going back and forth with the government, pouring through the legislation, sleeves rolled up, pencils out, and uh, we've got a better bill because of that. So this shows that uh, during times of crisis, Parliament needs to be able to play its role. Uh, thanks, Rachel. We've actually been in negotiations with the government and one of our, our key demands has been this. We're here in Ottawa. There's no way we should leave Ottawa with, uh, without having a guarantee that those who need help uh, can get that help right now, can get that help right away. So we're, we've uh, negotiated some language in the, in the unanimous consent motion to make sure that the, the major gaps are closed. And we've received those guarantees that the government will work towards closing those gaps. But I think that the, the Prime Minister should go beyond that and just simply get rid of all the criteria. We know there's so many people that need help. Let's just say, I'm asking the Prime Minister to say, if you need help, apply. The government has been very clear. If you apply, you will get the funds. So really it's just honest people who are desperate, but by technicality, they've earned a little bit of money or for some reason don't qualify, but they still desperately need the help to pay the bills or to buy groceries. Those people, because of their honesty, are being precluded. We should just say, the Prime Minister just should just say, if you need help, apply now. And um, by that you mean apply now, be able to get it, and then not have to uh, claw back during tax season is what I'm imagining. Um, but as a follow-up to that um, as well, the uh, Prime Minister did say a few days ago in one of his press conferences that he was looking into maybe increasing or allowing the CRB for people who are working about 10 hours or also expanding some programs for students. So um, how confident are you that this is something that actually can get done and get done, done soon enough so people can actually get the help they need? The Prime Minister could, could stand on the podium today and say to Canadians, if you need help, apply to the CERB. And just like that, everyone who needs help would get it. It is as simple as that. The prime minister could tell people, because there's two groups of people out there. There's people who are really honest, who desperately need help and are not applying because they, on a minor technicality, they're receiving a little bit of money. They've earned just a little under the threshold. For some reason, they will not meet the qualification because of those strict criteria. And uh, on the other hand, there's people who are afraid of the repercussion. They know they desperately need the help, but they're afraid that they're being forced into a position where if they receive the funds, maybe they're gonna get a penalty afterwards. What we wanna say to people and what the government should say is, people who need the help should get it right away. And then in the next tax season, we can uh, assure that those who didn't need the help that maybe earned enough money can then recover that. Uh, there are ways to deal with this, and the Prime Minister has the ability. We've negotiated to close some of the gaps, but we want to say really clearly, the Prime Minister just immediately get rid of the criteria, tell all Canadians who need help to apply, and ensure that they get the help that they need. Today we will be passing a bill to put in place a wage subsidy. While the government initially was not in favour of this measure, it eventually changed its mind. We, from the very beginning, have supported this measure because that's what we saw happening in a number of other jurisdictions and countries. We also pushed for uh, uh, something in the motion that will help stop the gaps and fix the gaps for small and medium-sized businesses. And there are also some parts on it about the borders, and I have to come back to that, unfortunately, this morning. Uh, at 10 to 10, based on the information I have, and despite all of the warnings we have, we have uh, all the warnings we've given with all the kindness, well, there are about 159 Mexican workers not tested for COVID-19 before they left Mexico. They did receive a brief exam they were not put in quarantine before leaving Mexico, who will not be tested for COVID-19 when they arrive 
in Montreal through the CBSA will not be put in quarantine by the CBSA, even though there are hundreds of hotel rooms available all around the airport and will be passed on to a private organization that will bring them to various regions in Quebec where agricultural businesses that have zero experience, no qualifications in terms of public health, will be held responsible for ensuring that these people are put in quarantine. We asked and we are publicly once again requesting, because we have to do this publicly, that the Canadian government accept its and assume its responsibility because this is an illness that is sometimes asymptomatic. The government has to ensure the safety of Canadians, make sure there's quarantine, and test foreign workers coming into Quebec and to Canada to work. Based on the past few years, here we're talking about thousands of people who go into the Quebec regions and villages. I do not believe that we can compromise on that while we are ready to collaborate. I cannot think that we can simply accept that the public health measures not be applied and that they be less stringent on these workers who are very welcome, I want to reiterate that, but that are less stringent than what are imposed on Quebecers. These measures are essential for people to feel safe and also for the safety of these agricultural producers. The federal government must assume its responsibility. That is that when the CBSA release foreign workers to move into the country, that these people are free of the COVID-19 virus. For the rest, I expect things to move together, to move quickly today so that we can simply leave. I'll go home to our own homes today after the session after having put in place these very necessary measures for kickback small businesses and medium businesses.